The, this particular view of, so to speak, of, of, of great images dominating mankind, of, of dark forces, the unconscious, and the importance of the inexpressible, and the necessity of discounting it and allowing for it, spreads into every sphere of human activity. It's by no means confined to art. It certainly enters into other spheres. It enters, for example, into politics. First, in a mild way, in Burke's great images of the society, great society of the dead and the living and those not yet born, bound together by myriad in, in unanalyzable strands to which we are loyal, so that every attempt to try and rationally analyze it, say, as a social contract, or say, as some kind of utilitarian arrangement for the purpose of living a happier life, or preventing collisions with human beings, every such attempt is shallow and betrays the inner, the inexpressible spirit which dominates any human association, which carries it forward, loyalty to which, spiritual immersion in which, is at the very heart of true, genuine, deep, devoted human life. Then, Müller, who was a German disciple of Burke, um, it really reaches its most eloquent form. Let me read it to you. Science, says Müller, can only reproduce a lifeless state. By state, he means a political state. Death cannot represent life. Nor can stagnation, that is the social contract, the liberal state, is what he means, the English state in particular, nor stagnation movement. Science, utilitarianism, the use of machinery, that does not convey the state. That conveys a mere factory, an insurance company, a mercantile society, not the intimate association of every physical and spiritual need, of the whole of the physical and spiritual wealth of the totality of the internal and external life of a people into a great, energetic, infinitely active and living whole. These mystical words then become uh, the heart and center of the whole organic theory of political life, and of loyalty to the state, and of the state as a semi-spiritual organization, which in a sense is symbolic of the spiritual powers of divine mystery, which is very nearly what the state among the Romantics, at least the extreme Romantics, undoubtedly becomes. It enters the sphere of law in the German school of historical jurisprudence. The notion that true law is not that which a given person, say a king or say an assembly, happens to pass, which is simply an empirical event guided perhaps by utilitarian or other contemptible considerations. It isn't that, nor is it something eternal, those laws of nature, those divine laws which any rational soul can discover for itself as thought, say, by the Roman Church, or as thought, say, by the Stoics, or as thought, say, by the 18th century French philosophers. They may have disagreed about what these laws were or how to discover them, but they all agreed that there were certain eternal, immutable principles along which human life had to be founded, uh, adherence to which made men moral, made men just, and made men good. This is denied. Law is the product of the beating force within the nation, of dark traditional forces, of its organic sap which flows through its body like a tree, of something which we cannot identify and cannot analyze, but which everyone who is true to his country feels coursing through his veins. Therefore, law is a traditional growth. Law is something which is partly circumstances, but partly the inner soul of the nation, now beginning to be conceived as almost individual. That which between them, they in some sense generate. And therefore, true law is traditional law. Every nation has its own law. Every nation has its own shape. And this shape goes far into the misty past, and its roots are somewhere in the darkness, and unless its roots are in the darkness, it is too easily overthrown. De Maistre, who was a reactionary French Catholic philosopher, who I think only half believed in this organic view of life, inasmuch as theoretically at least, he, had to, he, 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 was, he was an adherent of Thomism. De Maistre says, anything which man can make, man can mar. Anything which man can create, man can destroy. Therefore, the only thing which is eternal is this mysterious, frightening process which goes on far below the level of consciousness. This is what creates traditions. This is what creates states, nations, constitutions. Anything written, anything articulated, anything arrived at by sensible men in a cool hour is a thin, superficial thing likely to collapse when other equally sane and equally superficial and equally reasonable men uh, refute it. And this, therefore, has no true basis in reality. This is also true of historical theory, certainly, on the part of the great uh, German historical school, which again tries to trace historical evolution out of unconscious dark factors um, inter interweaving with each other in all kinds of inexplicable ways. There is even such a thing as romantic economics, in the form, for example, of 
the economics of men like Fichte and of Liszt, particularly in Germany, who believed in the necessity of, say, creating an isolated state, the geschlossene Handelsstaat, an isolated state in which the true spiritual force of the nation can exercise, exercise itself without being buffeted by other nations. That is to say, where the purpose of the economics, the purpose of money, the purpose of trade, is towards the spiritual self-perfection of man and does not obey so-called um, unbreakable laws of economics, which even people like Burke believed. Burke believed, said indeed, that the laws of commerce um, are the laws of nature and therefore the laws of God, and deduced from this that nothing could be done about passing any radical reform and the poor would have to starve. This is approximately the consequence of this. This was, as you know, um, uh, one of the um, consequences which led, uh, which, which, uh, led the laissez to Affairs School of Economics into a certain amount of justi justified disrepute. The, the romantic um, economics is the precise opposite of this. All economic institutions must be bent towards some kind of ideal of living together in a spiritually progressive manner. And above all, you mustn't make the mistake of supposing that there are external laws, that there are some kind of objective given laws of economics which in some way are beyond human control. This is a typical return to the rerum natura. This means once again you believe in a structure of things which can be studied, which sits still while you look at it and describe it. And this is false. Any such assumption that there are objective laws is simply a human fantasy, a human invention, an attempt on the part of human beings to justify their conduct and particularly their disreputable conduct, by calling into being, by placing the responsibility upon the shoulders of imaginary external laws, such as the laws of supply and demand, or in any other kind of external laws, this law of politics, that law of economics, which is alleged to be unalterable and which therefore in some way not only explains but justifies the poverty, squalor, and other un unattractive social phenomena. The romantics in this respect could be either progressive or reactionary. In what might be called revolutionary states, or radical states, created after the French Revolution, they were reactionary, they called back for some kind of medieval darkness. In reactionary states, say Prussia after 1812, they became progressive inasmuch as they regarded this artificial creation of the King of Prussia as a suffocating artificial mechanism which stifled the natural organic thrust of the life of the human beings imprisoned by it. So it could take either form. That is why we get revolutionary romantics and reactionary romantics. That, why, that is why it's impossible to pin romanticism down to any given political view, however often this has been tried. This, I think, is the fundamental, I think. Those are the fundamental um, bases of romanticism. Will and the emptiness, so to speak, of outer space, the fact that there is no structure to things, that you can really mould these things as you will, they only come into being as a result of your moulding activity. And therefore, opposition to any view which rep tried to represent reality as having some kind of form which could be studied, written down, learnt, communicated to others, and in other respects, treated in a scientific manner. There is no province in which I think this particular attitude is more evident than the field of music about which I have not yet spoken. It's uh, interesting and indeed even amusing to watch the development of attitudes towards music from the beginning of the 18th to roughly speaking in the middle of the 19th century. In the 18th century, particularly in France, music is regarded as on the whole a fairly inferior art. Vocal music has its place because it heightens the importance of the words. Religious music has its place because it contributes to the mood w which religion is meant to induce. But uh, it is clear, for example, Durfey, towards the end of the 17th century, says that it is obvious that the um, visual art is far more sensitive to the spiritual life of man than, for example, the ear. Fontenelle, who was the most civilized man of his time, and indeed of most times, said when instrumental music first began to invade France, and sonatas began to appear as against the kind of vocal religious music or operatic music to which he was used, which had a plot, which had explanation, which had some kind of extra musical importance. When sonatas appeared, he said, Sonat, que me veux-tu? Sonata, what do you want of me? And condemned instrumental music as a meaningless pattern of sounds, not really suitable for delicate or civilized ears. The, perhaps, this is, this is a fairly common attitude in France, in middle, certainly in the middle of the 18th century. It, it comes out with particular vividness in the verses addressed by the essayist and dramatist Marmontel in the 70s um, to uh, the composer Gluck, who at this period conquered the Paris stage. Gluck, as everyone knows, reformed music by 
placing music above the word and by forcing the words, so to speak, into some conformity with the true emotion and drama which he wished to convey by means of the music. He didn't, um, he, the great musical reform of no longer using music as a mere accompaniment to the meaning of the actual dramatic words. This outraged Mar Montel, who supposed drama and who supposed all art to have some kind of mimetic quality, that is to say, imitation of life. Imitation of the ideals of life, imitation of imaginary beings, ideal beings, not necessarily real beings, but still some kind of imitation, some kind of relationship to actual events, actual persons, actual emotions, something which was there in reality, which was the business of the artist, if necessary to idealize, but at any rate to represent as it truly is. And music, which had no meaning by itself, which was simply a succession of sounds, was clearly non-mimetic. Everybody saw that. Words had something to do with words spoken in ordinary life. Paints had something to do with colors perceived in nature. But sounds were very dissimilar to the sounds heard in rustling forests or to, or, to, or to bird song. The kind of sounds which musicians used were clearly much remoter from any kind of ordinary human experience than were the materials used by other artists. Hence, he attacked Gluck in the following words. Let me give you the English version first, then I shall read the French. He has arrived at Mountebank from Bohemia. He has arrived preceded by his reputation. Upon the ruins of a superb poem, he makes Achilles and Agamemnon howl. He makes Queen Clytemnestra scream. He makes the indefatigable, indefatigable orchestra snore. Il arriva, ce jongleur de Bohème, il arriva précédé de son nom. Sur le débris d'un superbe poème, il fit beugler Achille Agamemnon. Il fit hurler la reine Clytemnestra. Il fit ronfler l'infatigable orchestre. This is a very typical um, uh, attack of its time, so it being by no means uncharacteristic. This is approximately the attitude of those who didn't wish to give up association with nature or the idea of imitation to this peculiar notion of mere expression of the inner soul. This is true about Fontaine, writing in 1785. For him, the only purpose of music is to evoke certain emotions. Unless it evokes some kind of emotions which are already there, unless it is reminiscent of something, unless it is in some sense associated with experience of some kind, it has no value. Certainly sound as such express nothing and need never be employed in this particular way. Madame de Stahl, very typically, already in the beginning of the 19th century, speaking about music which she, of which she alleged herself to be extremely fond, said something of this sort. The value of music lies in the following. What man, she says, exhausted by a life of passion, can listen with indifference to the tunes of his tranquil youth. What woman whose beauty time has at last ravaged can hear without emotion the song that her lover once sang? Well, no doubt this is true, but this is a, a, very, a, very, a very different type of approach to music from that which was already being expressed by the Romantic Germans of this particular period. Even Stendhal, who liked Rossini with an almost physical passion, says about the music of Beethoven that he detests these combinations um, uh, he detests the combinations of this learned and almost mathematical harmony, rather the sort of thing which people nowadays might be inclined to say about, say, Schoenberg. <laughs>